Good afternoon. I'm Nate Kazmarek, Vice President and Director of Practice Groups for the Federal Society. I welcome you to this special session devoted to Dobbs, Roe, Casey, and the rule of law. We are pleased to have an excellent panel gathered, and we're looking forward to an insightful discussion. And we are fortunate to have a wonderful moderator with Judge Branch. The judge's, <laughs> the judge's uh, accomplished career and full bio is available to you for your review on the convention app and our website, as well as the bios of all of our panelists. But very briefly, the Honorable Judge uh, Lisa Branch serves, currently serves on the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Previously, she served on the Court of Appeals of Georgia. Judge Branch is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Atlanta Lawyers Chapter for the Federal Society. She is also a graduate of Davidson College and she earned her law degree from Emory Law School. Please join me in welcoming our panel and Judge Branch. Uh, thank you, Nate, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm always honored to serve as moderator uh, for a panel at a, the Federal, a Federal Society's annual Lawyers' Convention, especially this year, our 40th anniversary. Um, and it is particularly meaningful to do so on Veterans Day when we can honor all those who served our country. Um, welcome, certainly, to our afternoon panel entitled Dobbs, Roe, Casey, and the Rule of Law. On June 24, 2022, the U.S. Supreme Court released its 6-3 decision in Dobbs v. Jackson uh, Women's Health Organization overruling Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey, holding that the U.S. Constitution confers no right to abortion. While Dobbs rests firmly in our present, having been released less than five months ago, it nonetheless poses questions about <coughs> the past and future of the Supreme Court and of our society. As for the past, Roe, Casey, and Dobbs recognized the deep divide of our citizenry on the issue of abortion. Roe, at the beginning of the second paragraph of the opinion, said, we forthwith acknowledge our awareness of the sensitive and moral nature of the abortion controversy. Casey also nodded to the issue. Men and women of good conscience can disagree, and we suppose some always shall disagree about the profound moral and spiritual implications of terminating a pregnancy. And in fact, in Dobbs, it appeared in the first sentence, abortion presents a profound moral issue on which Americans hold sharply conflicting views. All of these statements hold true in our present with varying developments going on in the states. With the issuance of Dobbs, States with trigger laws immediately restricted abortions within these states. As of this past Tuesday, ballot initiatives guaranteeing abortion access passed in some states, and those that would have limited abortions failed in others. So what does the future hold? Certainly lawsuits seeking rulings on state constitutions regarding abortion, perhaps a push for new state statutes and state constitutional amendments, challenges to the legality of abortion pills, fights over whether prenatal life uh, will be, um, whether prenatal life is entitled to any of the rights enjoyed after birth, um, and, the, and the fate of Supreme Court cases based on notions of substantive due process, such as Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. Our distinguished panel uh, will address these issues during its discussion. I will briefly introduce them and then each will give opening remarks. The panelists will then have an opportunity to respond to each other, and I will also have questions. And as you have come to expect at these events, uh, I will open it up to audience Q&A, and I hope to do so no later than four o'clock. Our first speaker will be Professor Sharif Gurgis, who has been an associate professor of law at Notre Dame Law School since 2021. He is the co-author of What is a Marriage? Man and a Woman, a Defense, which was cited in a, in a dissent in United States v. Windsor. Prior to becoming a professor, he practiced law at Jones Day in Washington, D.C., focusing on appellate and complex litigation. He clerked for Justice Alito and Judge Griffith of the D.C. Circuit. He will address the arguments 
that Dobbs undermined the rule of law by too quickly dismissing the due process or equal protection arguments for Roe, by breaking from precedent in an unprecedented way, or by allowing a change in court personnel to lead to major changes in constitutional law. Our second speaker is David Cole, who is the National Legal Director for the ACLU. He has litigated many constitutional cases before the US Supreme Court, including Masterpiece Cake Shop v. Colorado Civil Rights Commission. He's on leave from Georgetown University, where he has taught constitutional law and criminal justice since 1990. He will argue that what is egregiously wrong about Dobbs is that those in the majority are opportunistically using originalism as their justification for overturning 50 years of precedent and calling into question the court's entire approach to the due process clause. Next, Carrie Severino. Uh, she is the president of Judicial Crisis Network and co-author with Molly Hemingway of Justice on Trial, the Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Court. She regularly files briefs on high-profile Supreme Court cases and served as law clerk to Justice Thomas and Judge Sintel of the DC Circuit. She will speak about the importance of the rule of law to the success of American society. She will discuss Roe and Casey as key examples of the Supreme Court undermining the rule of law by inventing a constitutional right never adopted by the American people through the constitutional process. Our final speaker will be Professor Mary Ann Case, the Arnold Schur Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. She was a litigator for Paul Weiss in New York before that, and her scholarship concentrates on the regulation of sex, gender, and sexuality. Professor Case will discuss three main issues, the comparative problem of abortion and the rule of law, the notion of the heckler's veto for the rule of law, and the implication for women. Professor Gerges. Thank you. Um, thanks to FEDSOC and to all the panelists. I've learned uh, a lot from each of you over the, over the years of doing events together. I want to touch on one point on each of four topics. Um, so broad but pointed. What, the first one is the historical analysis in Roe and Dobbs. The second is a point about stare decisis. The third about the court's legitimacy. And the fourth about equal protection. The first point first occurred to me when I was uh, actually doing an event on Dobbs at the Aspen Institute Ideas Festival, which is very different from the FEDSAC Festival. And I was on a panel with the great Neil Katyal, and he said, isn't it ironic that on one day in Bruin, the court says that you can't regulate guns, and on the next day in Dobbs says that you can regulate abortion. And that got me thinking, what would have to be true for those two cases to really be an apples to apples comparison? Dobbs following a bunch of other precedents, says that a constitutional right has to be based in the text or deeply rooted in history or integral to a broader right that is deeply rooted. So for guns and abortion to be similarly situated, you'd need it to be the case on guns it is, as it is on abortion, that first of all, there is no Second Amendment, no written right. As a matter of history, that from the dawn of the common law in 1160 until 1960 in the US, not a single English case, or state case, or federal case, or statute, or legal treatise, or law review article going out on a limb, grasping for tenure, had ever suggested there was a right to keep and bear arms. That on the contrary, in every one of those 800 years, and every one of those Anglo-American jurisdictions, the keeping and bearing of arms was unlawful. That its unlawfulness at common law was backed up by criminal statutes across the country, so that by 1858, half the states by 1868, three quarters, by 1877, all but two of the states, soon after that, all of the states, as late as 1960, all but four of the 50 states, in 1973, still two thirds of the states, had criminal statutes applying to every form of keeping and carrying. And that in 1973, seven judges on the court said, we will strike down the gun laws of all 50 states because our concept of liberty requires a right to keep and bear arms that's found nowhere in text or history or even any close analogy to precedent then Dobbs and Bruin would be on a par. Um, but they're not, and that's of course just reciting the, the, the historical analysis in the Dobbs opinion itself in the part critiquing Roe. The dissent, with a potential exception on whether pre-quickening abortions were unlawful, though they drop a footnote that cites the authorities explaining how it was and subject to lots of legal burdens making it clear even those early abortions were not a common law right, doesn't really contest the history. It talks obviously a lot about stare decisis, 
Carrie's going to go into a kind of detailed analysis of the different factors. I just want to make an overarching point corresponding to what I take to be the broad theme of the dissent on this, which is that this is an unprecedented departure from precedent. Never before has the court overturned a ma major precedent in the absence of a change in the law or the facts. The majority responds to that by saying, well, that's what we did in everybody's favorite First Amendment case, West Virginia versus Barnett, which reversed a case that was only three years old. But also, if the, if the Plessy doctrine of separate but equal came back to the court one year later, in the absence of a change in law or facts, we obviously sh still should have overruled it. So the dissent says, yeah, but those cases didn't involve an individual right. But the court, probably thinking individual rights may be sacrosanct, but not everything the court has called an individual right is sacrosanct, points to the Lochner cases, which were overturned, involved in, overturning a, an individual right to uh, freedom of contract. Now some people, I think, I think Professor Cole um, has, has pointed out, look, that was a case that didn't just shrink one individual right, but expanded rights for workers against exploitation. And Professor Amar, my old teacher, points out, well, but opponents of Roe would say the same thing of Dobbs, that it shrank one right, but expanded the rights to protection against lethal violence for the unborn. So then the dissent says, okay, never before have we overturned a case in the absence of a change in law or facts where there was an individual right at stake and the right was enjoyed by half of the country for 50 years which sounds like never before have we overturned Roe v. Wade, which is, which is true, and it's important. It's obviously a huge deal, and that's the theme of the general point, but I think it's a huge deal in a way that's fully captured by the analysis pro and con of the factors of stare decisis, so it doesn't do independent work. The, the, probably the, the other major theme that stands out is captured in one sentence where the dissent says, Roe and Casey are gone, only because the majority has always despised them and now has the votes to discard them, which is a very Justice Kagan sounding line that echoes a point she has made on the lecture circuit, that it looks bad for the court, it's bad for legitimacy when the court makes huge changes in law based on changes in personnel. I think there's something to that, but it depends. The main mechanism the Constitution provides for the people to give effect to their understanding of what a legitimate court looks like is the political process for picking the officials who pick the judges. So if a change in personnel is the result of a movement premised on the idea that Roe was illegitimate, not constitutional law, as John Hart Ely said, then the re resulting reversal of Roe is the legitimacy mechanism working. The fourth and final point, I actually think the strongest argument against the majority is not made in the dissent. And that's the idea that the majority gave too short shrift to the equal protection argument against, uh, for abortion, for the outcome in Roe. Um, in the end, though, I think that actually the, the, the majority, it should have given longer shrift to that argument, but that the bulk of its analysis, which is a critique of Roe's rationale, applies to the equal protection claim as well because those two arguments actually rise or fall together. How could that be? You think Roe was about privacy, this is equal protection, it's totally different. And it's true that Roe obviously made the point that, made the claim that privacy grounds a right to an abortion. But it couldn't stop there, because there was, just to say there's a privacy interest leaves open the question whether there's another interest that overrides it. So the court also had to say, and the Constitution forbids states to treat fetal life as innocent human life in this context. That somehow the Constitution itself, the Due Process Clause, takes a position on what is really a kind of abstruse question of moral theory. When does the fetus count enough to justify a ban? And it was that premise, and Roe's very specific answer to that, which is fetal viability, and Roe's lack of any legal sources to support it, that was the main thing that the liberal alliance who critiqued Roe, like John Hardili and Larry Tribe, pointed to and emphasized when they said that Roe was based on naked moral reasoning that has no legal pedigree to it. But it turns out that even though the equal protection arguments are supposed to avoid exactly that problem, they're supposed to avoid relying on the idea that the Constitution itself takes a position that requires states to discount fetal moral worth, actually does that in the end. I'll give you just one example. One common form of the argument is that 
there's an equal protection problem with abortion bans because they rest on an invidious sex stereotype. On, in particular, on the premise that women ought to perform motherhood, or ought to, at least in the sense of bearing kids to birth. And I think that the argument that that is invidious or constitutionally impermissible couldn't work if that belief is itself rooted in two other premises that are perfectly constitutionally permissible. Namely, the idea that parents have an obligation to bear the ordinary burdens of keeping their kids alive, plus the premise that fetuses count as kids. So the first point about parental duties obviously is constitutionally okay. So if you're gonna say there's an invidious constitutional, a, 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 an unconstitutional premise in the vicinity, you have to say that it's somehow independently constitutionally bad for states to treat the unborn as moral equals, which is exactly the premise that Roe was critiqued for and that the equal protection argument was meant to evade. And more to the point here, it's the premise that Dobbs, in the bulk of its analysis, spends a great deal of time and care refuting based on the historical arguments um, I started with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, Judge. I want to start by acknowledging that I'm unlikely to convince many people in this room. Um, but one of the things that I've always appreciated about law is that it provides an avenue for people with profoundly different views um, to disagree civilly. Uh, and I think that is uh, increasingly important in this increasingly divided time. So. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. In Dobbs, a bare majority of the court, not six to three, but a bare majority of the court, voted to overturn Roe and Casey because they said Roe and Casey were egregiously wrong, the scheme they set up was unworkable, uh, and there were no real reliance interests um, that the court had to um, consider. Um, in fact, um, Roe and Casey were not egregiously wrong. I would suggest that Dobbs is egregiously wrong. The scheme was quite workable um, and protected women's rights for 50 years uh, uh, with, um, uh, with clarity. Uh, and third, uh, huge uh, settled expectations were um, disrupted by uh, the decision. So let me start with whether Roe and Casey are egregiously wrong. The argument for why they're egregiously wrong is that they did not apply an originalist interpretation of the Constitution, which Sharif gave you. That, that is, there can't be a right to abortion because there wasn't a right to abortion when the Due Process Clause was adopted in 1868. That's the argument. But that method of interpretation has had four adherents, four cons relatively consistent adherents in the history of the Supreme Court. We've had 116 justices. Four have been sort of committed originalists. That's Scalia, Thomas, Gorsuch, and Barrett. A few others are occasional, um, uh, occasionally, occasional uh, uh, originalists, Alito uh, among them. Um, Kavanaugh among them, Justice Black um, uh, perhaps. Um, and no one, not even the most committed, not even Justice Thomas, applies originalism uh, consistently. Because they can't apply originalism consistently. Because if you applied it consistently, it would lead to results that we would all recognize, including in this room, as untenable. Brown versus Board was wrongly decided. Segregation is constitutional. Women are not protected by the, uh, by the Equal Protection Clause. Interracial marriage, Justice Thomas, that's not constitutionally protected because it wasn't protected when the Equal Protection Clause or the Due Process Clause uh, were adopted. The First Amendment would not protect libel or criticism of the government, for, for God's sakes. What every other justice has used over that period of time and what every originalist justice uses most of the time is familiar to all of us who are lawyers because it's what we do 
when we write briefs and argue cases in court. We start with the text and the history. We identify a principle that the provision sought to protect. We are guided by the precedents before us, applied by other people just as wise as we are, uh, maybe wiser, uh, to, to, to see how that principle has developed. Uh, and we apply it to the facts at hand. We recognize that that process um, per permits, necessitates the evolution of law uh, just as it does in the common law uh, context. And on that view, Roe is fully consistent with the approach that 112 of the 116 justices over the history of the court have, have applied. The Due Process Clause has, over time, protected the right to decide how to raise your child, the right whether to use contraception, the right whether to refuse medical treatment, uh, the right to marry someone of a different race or a different or the same uh, sex. Uh, in short, it has protected deeply personal and intimate decisions that should be made by individuals for themselves, not by politicians. That's the principle it applied. And it was correct, not egregiously wrong. So, so, so Roe and Casey were egregiously wrong only if 112 out of the 116 justices who have sat on the Supreme Court were egregiously wrong. I don't think so. Now, egregiously wrong is not enough, the court acknowledged. There also has to be you know, not substantial reliance interests and Justice Alito in his decision, probably the worst part of his decision, um, and there's a lot, to, a lot of competition there, but the worst <laughs> part of his decision is the fact that he gives the back of his hand to the reliance interests despite the fact that this is a right that fully half of the country has enjoyed for 50 years, that every woman of childbearing age um, has grown up uh, depending upon, and that has been critical to the um, introduction of women into an uh, equal status in public, uh, in public life. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, the decision cannot be justified by the law and I think that's why people think that it was justified simply by the fact that three justices appointed by President Trump who, who applied a litmus test and promised they would overturn Roe versus Wade did overturn Roe versus Wade. And that's why the court's um, approval rating today is at 25%, the lowest it's been um, in its history. Now finally, I want to suggest Dobbs was wrong because of who the burden falls upon. I'm sure there are many people in this room who would not get an abortion or support an abortion, even if it was their daughter, and even if it was an unwanted pregnancy, and maybe even if it was an unwanted pregnancy caused by rape. But I'm sure that there are others in this room who would support their daughter in getting an abortion if she found herself in an unwanted, uh, unwanted pregnant state. I am sure of that. And I'm, what I'm also sure of is every one of you will be able to do that because you have the resources to fly to the states where it's legal and pay the cost that you will have to pay to allow your child to exercise that right. Who does the burden fall upon? It doesn't fall on any of us. It's easy for us to say, oh, oh, it's the right of the fetus and you know, not the rights of women, because it's the uneducated, the poor, um, uh, who are going to be affected by, and the young, who are going to be affected by this. Now, I recognize that this is a difficult issue, because people can reasonably disagree about the status of the fetus and the morality of abortion. Absolutely. I grew up Catholic. I know that this is a hard decision. But given that the burden of pregnancy is so great and falls on one sex alone, that in no other context is anyone required to donate their body, to even temporarily, to save the life of another, and that people do reasonably disagree about how to balance the interest of a living 
human being and an unborn fetus. The decision, like the decision about who to marry, how to educate your kids, whether to refuse medical treatment, should be left to the individual, not to the government. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, Ms. Severino. Okay. Can you hear me? All right, the light didn't go on, but I, you can hear me. Um, thanks. So our panel is talking about Dobbs and the rule of law. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about what, what do we mean when we're talking about the rule of law and in what sense does, that, is, does Dobbs have anything to do with that? The rule of law um, is a concept that goes back thousands of years, at least as far as Aristotle, who talked about the rule of law and contrasting it with the rule of just an individual. So do we live in a system where our, our governors, those who have the power over us, those who have authority over us, are constrained by something outside themselves? Is it simply their individual desire of they think this is the right way to order things, or is there, is there actually a legal structure that applies um, across the board to everyone equally, and it also creates legal constraints on the government themselves and our governors themselves. Obviously, in America, we do live in such a system. We, we in the Federalist Society, we are, are, are so are exceptionally proud of our limited government, our separation of powers, the checks and balances that the framers have devised in the Constitution, the notion that uh, no one branch of government gets to be uh, the judge and the, the creator of law simultaneously and the executor of, of, of the law, that is key to our system. And, and that is key to the rule of law and really the success of, the America, of America because knowing that we have, uh, that we can rely on that is what makes it possible to build a, a, a cohesive society that has been as successful as ours. The challenge with uh, some of the uh, criticisms of Dobbs is I think it, often people have said, well, this is going to uh, disrupt uh, the rule of law because it requires uh, overturning a case. And I think it's un undoubtful that uh, stare decisis plays a role in the idea of the rule of law. The stability of law um, is important, but the stability of the law is, needs to be important within a our constitutional construct. So it is not simply stability for the sake of stability, and I think no justice in the court, and I, probably no one in this room, uh, including on both sides of, of this panel, would agree that every case that's been decided needs to be uh, maintained. And so it's, it's a question of which, which ones need to be maintained. And the, the, uh, the fact that a case is overturned, while it can cause some disruption in the law, in some cases may be necessary for the preservation of the rule of law itself. So uh, in Roe and then later, later in Casey, uh, what we had was a court that had, was interpreting a document that is our, our founding document that has a, uh, a method of amendment, so we can change this document, but instead of a, instead of uh, appealing to the method of amendment to update a constitution which for 200 years of our history had not been recognized to I include a right to abortion, and as Sharif uh, illustrated, it, not only had this not been recognized to be a part of the constitution, it was outlawed in most of the country for the vast majority of that time. Um, it, instead of updating that through the constitutional amendment process, it was updated through the courts. And you know, a lot of the criticisms uh, that, that David brought go to, was that a good thing to update? You know, what, what, what uh, should, is, is it better for women, poor women in particular, to have uh, access to abortion? Or as people on the pro-life side would say, is it better for the, their children who are even more marginalized than the poor women themselves, or, in, in, or the women as well, to not be subjected to uh, lethal violence within their own bodies, even if they think that is uh, what might be best for them in the time? The, all of those debates, are not what the court should be considering, right? That those are valid discussions if we're talking about should we actually amend the Constitution to include this right. But uh, it, it's it, when you when you're confronted with a right that is simply not in the Constitution and a court that that introduces it into that, that I think is the is one of the biggest affronts against the rule of law possible. And so a court setting that um, correcting that course uh, can only be said to be acting 
in, in within the rule of law anytime we're bringing it back into what the Constitution says. And this, this uh, is true whether the decision was decided yesterday and is incorrect or was decided 50 years ago and was incorrect. Um, we, we still live in a, in a government of, uh, of rule of law, not of men. Um, to just address some of the, uh, I think the, the biggest question here really boils down to the question of whether the stare decisis analysis of the court was correct. And so I'll, I'll, as uh, Sharif mentioned, I'll, I'll just go through a little bit uh, and it, maybe address some of the points that, that uh, David brought up. Um, and as one quick aside, though, I noticed that equal protection was brought up. And I, I'll, I'll say I think it is, uh, the court obviously didn't give a lot of discussion to that. But it does complicate the issue of, of bringing this, uh, trying to make this argument from an equal protection case when you have a, had the briefing in the, in the case which explicitly denied the fact that abortion was something that was limited to women. Um, it's interesting that David said that there's only, that this is a, a great burden and falls on one sex alone, but that's not actually the position that was taken by the litigants in the case. They argued that, that women and men might both be able to have abortions. So I, I'm not sure uh, if you can have your cake and, well, I mean, you, can you, you can't maybe necessarily have your cake and eat it too on that question. You have to decide whether you're gonna commit to the fact that it, it's, a, it's a women's issue or not. Um, in terms of the, the four factors uh, that were addressed in stare decisis, the first, the quality of reasoning. And I, I just wanna point out in this fact that um, the quality of reasoning in, in Roe and later in Casey didn't used to be as uh, maybe clear-cut and polarized an issue as it is now. When Roe was decided, it was widely criticized, and I think up until recently, and well, it's fa fallen very much out of fashion to criticize the reasoning in Roe, there were a lot, many people on both sides of the aisle, including legal le leading uh, uh, liberal scholars, and the court cites a whole bunch of them, from Lawrence Tribe to Mark Tushnet to uh, Archibald Cox, et cetera. Um, who pointed out the fact that Roe really was effectively legislation masquerading as law and didn't really even make an effort to uh, try to do a, a constitutional and legal analysis in the normal sense uh, to come up with its conclusions. Its, its decision of drawing this viability line and, and breaking up the trimesters, um, even if one, one thought that, hey, this, you know, the, the substantive due process arguments made sense, or the equal protection clause arguments made sense. The, you, there's no way you can get Roe's framework from either of those arguments and, and from the Constitution itself. It simply is an, it was an act of judicial fiat. That is the, uh, the opposite of the rule of law. Uh, this, the second um, factor, workability, um, I think you, you can see by the number of uh, circuit splits that were going on regarding this case and the, the length of time the court was having to, to address it by the fact that Casey had to exist in the first place and in fact rewrote Roe itself. So that's, that's sort of the Supreme Court almost acknowledging that the, that the reasoning was not great in the first place because the reasoning was reconsidered and updated in Casey. Uh, all of that goes to the illustration of how this, this is not exactly a workable decision. Um, uh, one factor uh, that David didn't, didn't address is the impact on other areas of the law. This is something that Justice O'Connor um, highlighted when she talked about the abortion distortion um, and how that, uh, it, other areas of the law, I think I can think offhand of like standing, of uh, criminal law, of First Amendment law when it comes to abortion clinic buffer zones and enforced speech and abortion, all of those have been interpreted by courts differently in the abortion context and other areas of the law. That should be a red flag as well. And then finally, on the reliance interest quickly, because I know I'm out of time, um, I, I think it's just very clear. The notion of reliance and saying, well, people have expected to have this right for a long time. That's great, but that's true of any case where stare decisis is a factor. Any case you're thinking of overturning, people have expected it to be on the books for a long time. That's not what we mean by reliance when we're talking about reliance. We're talking about people taking actions that they would not have taken if they had known this was not good law. And uh, I think as the court rightly points out, under that, under the traditional understanding of reliance, and again, here's an abortion distortion in action. We're redefining the notion of what reliance means in the context of abortion, which is the, the epitome of opportunistic uh, decision making. But if, if you look at reliance as reliance has always been understood, there simply aren't decisions, I mean, that, that you would say, well, I, I would not have uh, made this decision if I had known abortion was off the table that go farther out than say nine months. So obviously there are people who would say, you, you would say, hey, you know what, if I had known that abortion wasn't an option, I might not have chose to have this particular sexual encounter, for example. That, that is true. However, 
that doesn't go that doesn't go beyond the space of nine months. You know, so it, that that is not what we understand as a, the type of reliance that would be. Uh, dramatically impacted by this. And uh, uh, just as a final point, the reliance and, on other cases that the court has overturned is undeniably dramatically greater. Think of the overturning of the entire Jim Crow apparatus. The, basically, you know, half the country was operating on a legal system and, and that had huge amounts of investment and infrastructure based on a separate but equal position that the court correctly overturned. That, um, that shouldn't have been the reason not to correct this, the, the case and bring it back into keeping with the Constitution. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Case. Thanks so much. So I'm going to talk fast because I want to put a lot of points uh, on the table. Uh, and uh, I will use this as an occasion to plug my prior scholarship and my forthcoming scholarship, which expands on these points. I'm going to make uh, points as a comparativist, as a feminist, and as a doctrinal constitutionalist. Um, and unlike David, I do hope to change some minds, uh, partly because I am making somewhat different points. The first thing I would encourage upon the pro-life people in the audience is to familiarize themselves, if they are not already familiar, with a German constitutional approach to abortion, which has been an interesting parallel to the American, uh, where in the 70s they had a counterpoint to Roe v. Wade, in the 90s they had a counterpoint to Casey, uh, with opposite political directions. You had a more liberal legislature, a more conservative court. Uh, the court in the 70s said that um, there, the, the uh, unamendable provision of the German Constitution saying that there was a right, that human dignity shall be inviolable meant that it was that there was an affirmative obligation on the government uh, to stop abortion. Now you may think that should lead to uh, criminalization uh, and uh, harsh punishments and something you know um, that is now only possible in the United States uh, as since Dobbs. It has not. Uh, in part because the German approach has been the important thing is not that abortion be condemned, but that it be prevented. And if criminalization doesn't prevent it, then we will try other measures. Now, like, like Roe v. Wade, the German abortion decisions are not masterpieces of legal craftsmanship, and any um, good doctrinalist finds them completely incoherent. I was ready to go, uh, when I researched them originally, uh, to criticize them also as a feminist. Uh, but what surprised me is that they work. Everybody I said I told I was working on abortion said, why are you working on that? It's not interesting anymore. I would love abortion not to be interesting anymore. And if the German approach can make it not interesting, I'm all for it. Now, what the German approach does these days is in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, uh, a woman who undergoes counseling designed to um, open up to her a vision of a life with a child still wants an abortion after those, uh, that counseling. She's entitled to it. Indeed, if she is too poor to afford it herself, the government must pay for it, says the Constitutional Court. So the Germans fill a box you don't think can be filled, which is prohibited subsidized. Uh, in a country in which abortion is a constitutional wrong, 80% of abortions, last I checked, were paid for by the government. Um, now, Germany is a social state, and there are all kinds of things about the German system that me mean you can't necessarily take it over. But I would wish that at least, for example, uh, the counseling, uh, the pre dobbs counseling regimes were not finger-wagging in the United States, don't have an abortion, you'll have regret and cancer, but more affirmative, uh, like the um, German ones. Uh, the second thing I want to do is uh, what many people have done, beginning with the conference's first speaker, Jamil Green, on my side of the debate, and I haven't heard an answer from the other side of the debate, which is to talk about how originalism is bad for women. Now, I won't go into a lot of American originalism is bad for women, because at both the time of the original framing and the time of the framing of the civil post-Civil War amendments, women's rights were considered and affirmatively rejected. Um, Abigail Adams, right, remember the ladies. John's response was, ha ha, that's funny, and by the way, we uh, know better than to give up our masculine privileges. Uh, I won't go into this further because I discussed it as the only uh, woman with a speaking part at the Federalist Society's um, student convention about a decade ago, and that led to an article uh, I would ask, uh, commend to all of you, called The Ladies Forget About Them. Um, 
a feminist perspective on the limits of originalism published in Constitutional Commentary. Do you want to say a few words about the sex discrimination argument? The argument that I was surprised to see had not been made, it's one that was made in, in the 70s, which is uh, focused on uh, the unequal duty to rescue uh, on the part of parents. Uh, it, we do not have a generalized duty to rescue in the United States, and in particular with respect to parents, we do not require fathers to contribute any portion of their body, uh, their blood, uh, their marrow, their kidneys, even if the result would be to save their child's life. Um, and I think if that is the case, it cannot be demanded of women that they give their body at the risk of their life um, to uh, save a potential child. When an, actual living child need not be saved. Now, of course, if you know equal protection law, you can know that the solution is to either ratchet up or ratchet down. I'm perfectly comfortable with ratcheting up and saying parents should have a more generalized duty to rescue. I want to talk about another set of equal protection problems that I don't think the um, conservatives have faced, which is um, if now abortion is uh, not protected, uh, then it's not clear that any reproductive rights uh, are protected. Uh, and just as abortion can now be criminalized, so can, um, you know, we, we can now uh, imagine something closer to a one-child policy or a license to parent or all kinds of things that were not thinkable precisely because of modern substantive uh, due process uh, doctrine. Without, sexual, without existing substantive due process-based sexual and reproductive rights as a backstop, um, is as much within the power uh, of the court to extend privileges now granted by law, uh, is the possibility that even married heterosexuals can have their affirmative reproductive rights curtailed. This is something that Scalia recognized. And I have so often throughout my life said, Scalia and I, when we connect the dots, we see the same figure. The only difference is his dreams are my nightmares and vice versa. <laughs> but um, I, he, you know, I, I think he is with me on this one. Um, let me then go on to um, what I'm calling the heckler's veto on stare decisis, which again I think is a word of caution to uh, the Federalists more generally. And I saw the, um, the, the germ of this in uh, Amy County Barrett's scholarship on stare decisis, um, and I'm seeing the practice in the current Supreme Court. And I want to again uh, mobilize as a comparativist on this score, right? Uh, in late 1990, I was at a conference at NYU, uh, including a majority of members of the United States Supreme Court and the Russian Constitutional Court. And Sandra Day O'Connor gave her, you know, school marmish lecture about, you know, the rule of law and constitutional courts. The end of which she said, "Any questions?" And someone from the Russian Constitutional Court, who was at that time dealing with the Chechen crisis, uh, raised his hand and said, "Just got one question: How do you get your decrees enforced?" And she said, "Oh, you know, we give them to the marshal." She didn't really understand the question. Uh, now, I'm not talking here when I'm talking about the dangers of the heckler's veto, about the standard problem of, uh, you know, the, it, it, is the Supreme Court being respected or not. I'm talking about um, what, is hap what, what Barrett suggested was a factor in stare decisis was uh, whether the decision was accepted. And of course, that's dynamic, right? If you know, as a legislator, as a, as a, uh, as a private actor, um, as, as anyone in the system, that the way you can get a decision overturned is not to respect it, to pass blatantly unconstitutional laws, then the rule of law unravels. And I think we are seeing this, and that the Supreme Court is cooperating with it uh, when it um, does, dissent, does dissents from denials of certiorari or even concurrences with denial of certiorari, inviting um, more unrest. Um, and I'll finally say, uh, again, as a, uh, a cautionary tale, and this is also a genuine question I have for anyone that can answer it, um, if now doubt is cast on whether there is substantive due process, um, what should not be forgotten, which is again something Scalia recognizes, and, and again, I see with Scalia, all incorporation is substantive due process. So I don't see how this Supreme Court can, consistent with the rule of law, um, maintain its aggressive stance on, for example, uh, religious freedom and guns um, if it's casts doubt on substantive due process. And the, 
clerks from Justice Thomas's chambers in the group are saying, oh, privileges and immunities. I invite you to consider whether you, whether Justice Thomas, whether anyone is prepared to say that Pope Francis or the Dalai Lama loses all religious rights on landing in this country because neither of them are citizens. Thank you. And we've had a, a lot of differing views on this, so I would like to open this up to the panelists to respond to any of your fellow panelists. Professor Gerges? Sure, uh, just a few quick points. So one, it is very far from the truth that you have to be a Barrett or Scalia or Thomas-style originalist or Gorsuch to think that Roe was badly reasoned. Um, Carrie mentioned some of the people, right? At the time, John Hart Ely, leading liberal scholar, said, Roe is bad constitutional law because it is not constitutional law and gives almost no sense of an obligation to try to be. Larry Tribe said behind Roe's verbal smokescreen, the basis for its judgment is nowhere to be found. And he said something like, you have to read and one, one has to read and reread the passage to make sure nothing has been inadvertently left out. Um, judge Henry Friendly, the leading liberal judge of the 20th century who did not make it to the Supreme Court, had an unpublished opinion where he focused on and dealt with the best argument for Roe, a Roe-style right, which is the kind of argument rooted in the sorts of precedents that David was mentioning. And he there says there is a huge disanalogy between the right to refuse medical treatment and the other kind of privacy and autonomy rights that either affect only the adult making them or other consenting adults, or in the limiting case, the right to rear your kids at direct your kids' education, which affects a third party, but not in a way that anyone can reasonably think is harmful in every instance. On the one hand, and the right to an abortion on the other, which is quite different. It has, it's, it has an impact on beings that states can permissibly see as third parties who are harmed every time and have not consented to it. That huge difference between privacy and autonomy cases that David mentioned and abortion is reason enough to think that Roe is completely unhinged. And that same point about precedent was one made by uh, one of uh, Blackman's uh, former clerks who was a, a, a big fan of it. O on the equal protection point that we, um, that well, we don't demand of men that they donate their kidneys so there's sex discrimination. Note that we don't demand of women that they donate their kidneys or their blood. It at least opens the possibility that what's going on is that states, officials, people are seeing a difference between the failure to provide an organ on the one hand and the kind of intentional killing of the fetus that's required to remove the fetus in an abortion, on the other hand. Um, that's a kind of distinction that shows up in our law that's discussed in, in, um, in Vaco v. Quill and in Glucksburg itself, the, the assisted suicide cases. You can dispute it or not, um, but, but that's obviously a distinct difference that might explain in a non-invidious way why we let men and women refuse to donate their blood but not to intentionally kill to remove um, a fetus. I, the, on the point of whether we do that at the risk of the woman's life, and this is what I'll end with, I do think there is a strong constitutional argument rooted in the kind of history argument that Dobbs itself lays out for the idea that there's a constitutional right to life-saving procedures, precisely because all of the regulations, all of the jurisdictions that I mentioned do n expressly make an exception for cases where a procedure is needed to save the mother's life. So I think there is a deeply rooted history uh, of protecting that. So I would just say on the equal protection argument, if anybody thinks that abortion would be outlawed if men uh, were the ones who bore the burden, um, you know, you're living in some world that I don't recognize. Um, the, the, the reason that this has been uh, outlawed and regulated uh, is because it's women who are affected uh, and it's men who have uh, enacted uh, the rules. So uh, it, it is it, without question, I think there's a, a fundamental equal protection uh, problem here. With respect to Sharif's, uh, uh, you know, invoking, um, you know, John Hart Ely and Henry Friendly, great, great uh, thinkers, great scholars. Um, yeah, you can make art, you can certainly criticize Roe on, um, within the frame of uh, doctrinal elaboration, the kind of constitutional interpretation that every justice uses, even the originalists, most of the time. Uh, but that's not what Justice Alito said. That is not what the decision, the decisions didn't say, well, we, we buy 
uh, you know, we buy that due process protects all these things that were not protected at the time it was an, uh, adopted. You know, the right to marry uh, someone of the same sex, the right to have sex with someone of the same sex, the right to refuse medical treatment, the right uh, to raise your kids. None of those things were protected at the time that the due process clause was. And the court didn't say, well, all of those things, yeah, even though they're not in the Constitution, uh, even though Kerry would say that's legislating from the bench, those are all right. And it's just that they went too far in this case. That's not what they said. People made that argument in Casey, and the court rejected it and said, no, we, are, um, we, we believe that this is a uh, critically important personal intimate decision, just like those other decisions. Yes, it has costs. Absolutely, it has costs. But we weigh those costs, and we weigh those costs in, with, with the undue burden standard. It's not like it's an absolute right. It's a, it is a right that balances the interest of the woman uh, and, the, uh, and the interest uh, of the fetus. So, so what the court said is, and its entire justification is that this, these 50 years of decisions were wrong because the court did not, the, those courts did not use originalist interpretation. An originalist interpretation, as I said before, is something that, if, if that's true, if any decision is wrong, that did not use originalist interpretation and can't be squared with originalist interpretation, then, you know, really all bets are off. And we are, we are down the road to segregation is legal, women aren't protected by the Equal Protection Clause and the like. Um, and, and that's why it's clearly not egregiously wrong, because even the originalists will not about, apply originalism when they don't like the results. They'll invoke it when they do like the results, and they'll look the other way when they don't like the results. The best example of that is the question of whether this case means that all those other due process rights are now out the window, because that was one of the arguments. Because if you're an originalist, then they are. And, the court, and, and Alito and Kavanaugh go out of their way to say, oh, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't mean to call into question the right of same-sex marriage, the right of same-sex intimacy, the right of contraception. Uh, the right of interracial marriage. We don't, we don't mean to call any of those things into question. Why? Um, you know, on, on no good reason given, except, you know, they're not willing to overturn those. Not because originalism would lead to affirming those decisions, but they're just not willing to overturn them. Justice Thomas then disagrees and he says, actually, I think we should reconsider the right to contraception. I think we should reconsider same-sex marriage. I think we should reconsider uh, 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 Lawrence versus Texas, the right of consenting adults to choose with whom they have sex without the state interfering. But he stopped there. He wasn't willing to say, I think we should um, reconsider interracial marriage. Now, why is that? Not because originalism would lead to any different result, but because Justice Thomas is not willing to go there. And for good reason, he's not willing to go there. But for the same reason, originalism is not a legitimate justification for declaring prior decisions egregiously wrong when four justices out of 116 have ever employed it in any uh, consistent way. Um, so. To quickly address some of David's points first and then Marianne's, uh, the, the notion that if you uh, actually interpreted law and were originalist thing that we would go back to segregation and you know the anti-miscegenation laws would go out, all, the, all of these things, I think is just flat out not true. I think that you look at the originalist uh, members of the court, I, 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 I'm just don't, that, they, they are ab there are absolutely originalist defenses for everything from Brown versus Board on down. Um, and you know, sometimes they do involve the privileges and immunities clause. In some cases, I mean, Justice Thomas, uh, simply because he says something's not uh, something I would reach via substantive due process. Look at the McDonald versus City of Chicago case. He uh, obviously uh, thought there was a very strong Second Amendment uh, right to bear arms as, as to the federal government, um, but illustrated that you can be really consistent and say, hey, I'm not willing to introduce something that I don't think is a, is a proper method of interpretation to then apply it to the states. However, uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause has been e effectively uh, eliminated from our consideration, and it's a part of the Constitution, and just as one uh, shouldn't, un in keeping with the rule of law, add things to the Constitution that aren't there, if we really want to be do justice to the document, we ought to take seriously the provisions that actually are in the document. Um, 
to Marianne's point that um, you know perhaps originalism is bad for women because if we because at the time of the founding women did not have uh, the level of rights that they have today. I don't think that's an argument that originalism is bad for women. That's an argument that that maybe the early American law wasn't sufficiently protective of women. But that the idea of originalism is is not a substantive one. It's a and it's not it's not originalism because we think that everyone had everything right in 1789. Originalism, and, and I have a, had a degree in, in linguistics before I, I went to law school, it just strikes me as how one interprets language. If we're having a conversation, we have to use those words, we, we interpret those words as they're understood by people using the language that we're using. We can't have some secret code where I say yes and it means no in my head any more than, and, and there, while there are times historically that link words clearly do shift and change their meaning, if you're going back and interpreting a historical document, you have to ask, well, what did that document actually mean at the time? You can have words that have changed their meaning. I'm not gonna interpret them according to how they, what they mean in, in the 2022 dictionary. I'm gonna look at what it actually, what they meant because this is language and communication between these people at the time. Um, if we if we accept that the Constitution is that, that that there's legitimacy to the fact that our government was Constitution was ratified by the American people and then has been uh, it carried on since then, we have to ask what did they ratify? We, it, it, it's it is a linguistically bizarre to say that what they ratify whatever these words mean in a 2022 dictionary or whatever these words we feel like they ought to mean today. If we're if we're look if we really ta are taking seriously that those are limits placed on government, then we have to take seriously what they meant at the time. Now we might not agree with all of those rules. It, it, it's not only you know not only were those original rules for bad for women, they were obviously very bad for all Black Americans. I mean, slavery was is in the Constitution, right? But that doesn't mean that originalism and that understand that we don't read documents differently because we need to get to to the results we want. That's a results-oriented way of reading it. The, the solution for that, and it was a horrible and hard-fought solution, was, was a combination of the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments. That's how we fixed that. It would be obviously much better if we had fixed it by amending the Constitution in the first place, but, that, but to say we're going to reinterpret this document using illegitimate uh, linguistic methods doesn't, is, is not really, a, or, or illegitimate logic doesn't, isn't fair to say I'm going to use that to get to a better uh, substantive result. Um, and then just finally, I, 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 I really actually like Marion's point about the heckler's veto on stare decisis. I think we would have to be careful not to allow the acceptance to become that. I think that's actually a factor that has come in into a lot of the discussions about the court's legitimacy nowadays. Um, you know, David mentioned the, the low uh, approval ratings. I think it's very hard to, uh, separate those out from the fact that we have had a constant drumbeat of, of criticism, particularly in the media, against the court and, and people suggesting that the court would be illegitimate, up to Supreme Court justices themselves, which I think is, is really unfortunate to see um, some of the comments, for example, by Justice Kagan suggesting uh, that her colleagues were acting illegitimately. I think it's one thing to criticize someone's um, Reasoning in a case, but I think is another thing to Im Im impute some of the motives uh, that were done it, it, by her speaking. And I think that is that sort of heckler's veto. Of it. it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if everyone just all day, every day says, wow, the, how could the court do this? They, we, we can't trust them. Then it's no wonder that their opinion polls go down. I think that's one of the many reasons that looking at opinion polls is not the way that judges, of course, should come to their conclusions and decisions. Um, I think that's why people protesting, hoping that that, in, in people's, on the justices' lawns, which still continues to this day, um, isn't the way that you should make your arguments. I think uh, we, should, we should make them using uh, reason and analysis. So, thank you. Thanks. So let me uh, take Carrie's points in reverse order, because I think they're a uh, fundamental misunderstanding in the first place of what I said, and the second place of uh, the difference between originalism and textualism is currently implied. On this. Um, I, I said that I'm going to take Carrie's points in reverse order, because I, and I think they uh, indicate a fundamental misunderstanding, uh, first place in, about what I said concerning the heckler's veto, and in the second place, the difference between originalism and textualism as they are currently applied. So on the heckler's veto, I, ver I am not talking about disrespect for the court by opponents of what the court is doing. I am talking about incentivizing disrespect for the rule of law by people who think the court will if they hear enough noise, if they hear enough unrest, if people do not accept their decisions, um, will get those decisions reversed. If a factor in stare decisis that is given 
potentially determinative weight is how much dissatisfaction with the opinion, not with the court, with the opinion, uh, what the result is, that incentivizes dissatisfaction. Um, it's the difference between Gore in 2000 accepting um, the determination of the Supreme Court that he lost the election and the tendency now of people not to give up their election denialism. Uh, because if they, if they take Dobbs seriously, if they take the heckler's veto notion seriously, the more they protest, the more likely they are to succeed. And that's, that just dissolves the rule of law into um, a, a system in which disrespecting it, and I don't mean thinking the court is acting illegitimately, I mean actively taking steps against settled law in hopes of unsettling it. That's dangerous. So, I, I, and the first point, I think Kerry is conflating textualism and uh, originalism as currently practiced. I have, because of the fortuity of the language in the Constitution, I have very few problems being a constitutional textualist. I will note that the recent, uh, uh, most infamous, uh, allegedly originalist decisions on guns and on abortion do not focus on the text. Famously, Dobbs focuses on the absence of the text, and we hear a whole lot about practices in, from the 13th to the mid, to, to the early 20th century, that is to say in precisely that period in which women were um, at some points not even considered human. I'm wearing my little human bracelet here just so you know exactly what you're dealing with, right? Yeah. I'm labeling myself, I'm not ordinarily an identitarian, but homo sum et nihil human me alien puto. I am human and nothing human is alien to me. Uh, I have only been recognized as fully human relatively recently, before the period uh, in which, uh, to which the originalists uh, look. And um, yeah, I, I set out in detail how this happens in the framing of the original constitution in this piece I talked about. Similarly, the framers of the 14th Amendment um, did consider what it would mean, 14th, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, what it would consider for women's rights. I'll just give you one random sample. There are many, many, many quotes. Lee Vanderveld also writes about this. Um, so someone is asking, uh, talking about against uh, abolition of slavery. Parent has a right to the services of the child. Husband has a right to, of property in the service of his wife. Uh, all these rights rest upon the same basis as a man's right of property in the service of slaves. This relation is clearly and distinctly defined by the laws and clearly and distinctly recognized by the Constitution. And then somebody else says, Senator Edward Cowan, um, this amendment was made simply to liberate the Libra Negro slave from his master. That is all there is of it. Will anybody undertake to say that this was to prevent the involuntary servitude of my child to me, of my apprentice to me, or the quasi-servitude quasi to which the wife to some extent owes to her husband? Certainly not. That's originalism. Before I open it up for questions, um, I just would be curious if any of the panelists would like to express any thoughts on the Chief Justice's concurrence proposing a middle way. I note that he is not, his concurrence has not been the topic of discussion here today. Uh, uh, um, so a lot of people on both sides have thought this is an all or nothing affair. The, Roe and Casey say you can't have a ban before viability at 22, 23 weeks. This is a ban at 15 weeks. So you have to pick Roe and Casey or this law. Um, the chief said, no, we don't have to pick because we can overturn just part of Roe. Because actually Roe had two parts. One was there's a right to an abortion, and the second was, you can trump it at viability. And we get rid of the second, the first is standing, and we don't have to decide whether to stick with it, because this law leaves a reasonable opportunity to abort. I think reasonable opportunity is a very different conception from just the general idea that there's a right to abort. It comes with a different set of justifications, and it's found nowhere in Roe or Casey or any of the precedents they rely on. If you wanted to break it into two parts, Roe really said, there's strict scrutiny on any regulation of abortion at any stage, and that scrutiny is satisfied only from viability. If you get rid of the viability line, what you're left with is there's strict scrutiny on any abortion regulation at any stage, which is an incomplete legal thought. You need to fill it in with a substantive view about the fetal worth in order to get the conclusion that he wanted. So, I, you know, I think Justice Roberts' decision um, uh, shows that 
uh, there was no necessity in this case to overturn uh, Roe versus Wade, that um, the, the c case could be resolved uh, and the law could be affirmed uh, without overturning Roe versus Wade. Um, the five justices who decided to do um, President Trump's bidding um, you know, went beyond what was necessary to decide the case. And, and Chief Justice Roberts has long been a, an advocate of minimalism, that if we don't need to decide something in order to resolve the case, we ought not decide it, we should not decide it, and that that's actually an important part of uh, the rule of law, an important part of the legitimacy of the court. Um, you know, I think what's clear is that the five, at least with respect to abortion, don't particularly seem that concerned about the um, institutional legitimacy of the court. They seem more concerned about getting their way while they have the votes, which is a perfectly legitimate um, uh, view if you're a member of Congress or you're a member of city council, uh, not if you're a, a justice. I think you do have to think about the institution. You do have to think about legitimacy. And it is perfectly appropriate to call into question the legitimacy of the court when it's acting illegitimately. And this was one instance. Kerry says, oh, well, you know, Justice Kagan, she used the word illegitimate. You know, Justice Thomas has been calling the court illegitimate uh, for, you know, for, for years because it does not apply originalist, his originalist interpretation. Uh, Ju Chief Justice Roberts called the court illegitimate when it decided the same-sex marriage case. Chief uh, uh, Justice Scalia called the court illegitimate virtually every time he disagreed with the decision that the, that the majority uh, came to, and he did it very colorfully. Um, and I'm, I, I, I bet if we go back, we can uh, find Kerry calling the court illegitimate for some of these decisions. So there's nothing wrong with using that term. The, 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 the critical thing is, is the court legitimate or not? And when it has a 25% approval rating, that is a serious concern because institutional legitimacy is critical to our survival as a pluralist nation with diverse views. And when you know even the court has uh, has approval ratings that low, we're in trouble. And it's only in the wake of Dobbs uh, that it's that we've seen that. So, to uh, Chief Justice Roberts's opinion. I, I think it only shows that you can that you could dissolve this case without overturning Roe and Casey if his own opinion would not have overturned Roe and Casey. But as as I think it was Solicitor General Prilligar pointed out in an argument, and both all of the litigants that argued at the court acknowledged, there simply isn't a way to uphold the Mississippi law without overturning Roe versus Casey. I think your options are to overturn it, or to maintain it or to re rewrite it to such a degree that I think it's fair to say it was, it was overturned. I think Chief Justice uh, Roberts' opinion offered a different standard than Roe or Casey, and uh, as, uh, as the Solicitor General said, that would amount to effectively overturning them. So it's, it's simply uh, not, uh, not the middle ground that I think it purported uh, to be. I, I do think there's a difference between, uh, I mean, there, there's a difference between uh, justices uh, calling out the, the uh, particular opinions and cases that they disagree with, and suggesting something about the motives of their colleagues, uh, which is what I read into uh, to Justice Kagan's remarks. I mean, Justice Scalia, who I, it was happy to, as you point out, colorfully disagree with, for example, Justice Breyer. They went around the country having debates on this topic. I think, nonetheless, considered him a longtime friend and wasn't saying he was personally intentionally subverting law, and I think that's what Justice Kagan walked up to doing. So that, that, that is something that um, I think is, is concerning. So first I want to associate myself with David's most recent remarks. And then secondly, uh, I want to say that what uh, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts was doing, I think is in, in some sense in the spirit of the German constitutional court, that is to say, do something that's workable, uh, even if it's not perfectly intellectually coherent. And I want to make a broader point about this that I make to my classes all the time, which is very often in law, the right place to be um, as, a, as a practical, as a sociological, as a um, matter is somewhere in the middle of a slippery slope where it's very difficult to gain a foothold. And it's uh, one of the dangerous lessons I think most first year law students learn is that the moment you slide down the slippery slope, you're safe. 
So in contracts class, the kid says, who says, sure, I can sell myself into slavery, um, is insulating him or herself from criticism and finding that toehold in the middle of a slippery slope is much more of a challenge. Um, and I realize it's a challenge some people do not meet in their efforts, but um, I have learned from my experiences in Germany to commend those who try. Thank you all. Um, and what we've got looks like two microphones set up, one in the front, one in the back. So I'm going to alternate. Let's start with the gentleman in the front. Thank you. Uh, David Burnett from practicing out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, before I went into law, I was a critical care nurse for six years and married to a beautiful OBGYN who couldn't be with us today because she's delivering babies. So this issue, is, that's a predicate for my interest on this issue. and and. Feeding off of the healthcare question, I have a three-part question, and if you if that's not allowed, then just pick your favorite. But um, picking off of the healthcare question, most healthcare, whether it's the practice of medicine or the regulation, is regulated at the state level. And if Dobbs was incorrect and abortion is permitted to be regulated at the federal level, would that open the door to additional regulations? Question one. Question two. We heard a discussion of the common law duty to rescue or lack thereof. What I haven't heard is a discussion of the exceptions, which I was taught in law school, which would be if you exist in a special relationship to someone, you do have that duty to rescue. Or if you have already assumed the duty, you have that duty to rescue. Or if you have created the peril, all three of which do apply in the case of a pregnancy. And then the final question being, if we believe, if we accept the premise that Dobbs was wrong under the premise of stare decisis, wouldn't overturning it either now or in another 49 years commit the very same error that people here say Dobbs committed? Thank you. All right, there are a lot of questions there. Does anybody want to pick one, two, three, and then and give an answer? Uh, I, I was so on the on the point about. Um, Healthcare. I think you're right. There is a general duty. There's a there's a reason, but but it has not been interpreted to require of parents either of these kind of donation actions. Um, on, on you know, on the related question of whether that that reflects some kind of bias against women, I think one of the most embarrassing facts for the sex discrimination argument or the argument that in a world where men got pregnant, abortion would be allowed, is that the gender gap on abortion. In, sorry, the gender gap on, in public opinion on abortion is smaller than it is on almost any other issue. You would expect at least some asymmetry between men and women. There's a Vox explainer. I don't usually recommend those. But there's a Vox explainer uh, that, that points this out. Um, and, and that's just a, a kind of practical empirical point that suggests that the distinctions you're pointing to and on the one hand and the, and the norm against intentional killing of the fetus on the other reflected in abortion laws reflects something other than invidious discrimination. If I can just jump in, one other comment on the, on the parity between men and women is, I think the closer example of, is that men are not in fact allowed to cause the end of a pregnancy of their own child. Like if a, if a, if a man attacks a woman he's impregnated to kill their baby, we prosecute that and we should. And that is the close, the intentional, intentionally causing the end of a pregnancy and intentionally taking that fetal life is prosecuted against men, and, and so the, I think that, that is the closer uh, and in parallel. In terms there. of duties of care, we do require them to provide child support, even if they didn't consent to doing that, and even if the, the sex was contracepted, so they say that, well, they didn't assume the risk of that, and that's the closest that's biologically possible to demanding of the man some kind of positive support right. as well, and, all, and involves his own labor. We just, we, we, you can't pretend that the biological realities don't exist that women are the ones who are having the pregnancy. So you simply couldn't have the same exact uh, parallel, but I, the closest example is, is just not causing the death of the, of the there, child. There's certainly a biological difference, but you know, when one starts to analogize a woman making a decision about her own body um, and whether she's gonna go through the um, dangerous and sometimes deadly process of um, bearing a child to term and analogizes that to a man beating and killing uh, his spouse's or some woman's uh, unborn fetus. Uh, 
I, we really are in different worlds. We are really are. You know, and that, that, Satan I, I, and, gives and her poison, thing, but it doesn't affect her body, but it affects the continue. child. And the, and, and the same thing to Sharif. I mean, the, the, the notion that, I mean, do you really believe that if we had legislatures that were, um, uh, you know, 80% women, that we would have laws against abortion? Do you really believe that? Is it, is it no, is it, com I absolutely do. And this is a reflection so of the polarization, this, and, and that's exactly right. We live in different worlds, which means that most pro-choicers do not know what actually motivates most pro-lifers. And at a practical level, why isn't it the case? Why is it the case that men and women oppose abortion at almost exactly the same rates, if it's so, so much worse if it's such a reflection of discrimination yeah, against and women. And why is it the case that on every abortion referendum that's gone to the public since Dobbs has been decided, abortion has been, has been uh, the, the re regulation of abortion has been the loser and the right has been. But how is that an answer to my question? The, and, and, and why is it that, 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 that it's an answer to your question. It's, an, it's, it's not an answer, no, no, uh, my question was specifically about sex discrimination. Your point is an important point yeah. about the current state of play, which is that there's a lot of opposition to the pro-life view that's reflected in yeah. these referendums. My question is, if, if abortion opposition is rooted in sex discrimination, why is there no gap in the rate at which men and women are pro-life? I think if you look at those, those votes, you will see there, there is a gap. And I think at one, while, as long as, as long as the Supreme Court's decisions had guaranteed a right to abortion, it was quite easy for people to say, I'm against abortion, knowing that their child or they could in fact get an abortion if they, if they needed an abortion. Now, now when, when that's no longer the case and women's uh, rights really are on the line, what you're seeing is women uh, mobilizing, women voting, and women saying, yes, this is a right that we That assumes that women were faking it, or at least faking it higher no, rates just, than men until now. Cost, it's just way less costly to take that. Uh, and we're going to let this side of the room yeah. answer these questions. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I, I, <laughs> just, just one comment to the analogy. I think if, you, if, a, if a man, it, 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 truth of the matter is that abortion pills are not, are not without side effects to the woman, but say there, say there was one and you could just give them the pill that the only, the only effect would be that it kills the unborn life inside of her. And a woman could take that pill and it wasn't uh, prosecuted and a man could give her that pill, even you know, secretly give her that pill somehow, so that but it only affected the baby, that would um that would still be that would that actually is more of a of a discrimination, I would say, on the basis of sex where the mother has the right to kill the child but the father does not. Uh, so I anyway I, I just maintain it, it just to just to clarify that it doesn't have to be a matter of him physically attacking the woman, although practically speaking I think that's unfortunately how such things often do play out in the real world. But and it should be that neither I'm 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 with Marianne, let's let's raise the standards for everyone. Let's make sure that both parties are required to support child support and and uh, and to maintain the children, but we have to recognize biological realities and just you know, standing here as, as someone who can illustrate that not all women uh, think that it, have, asking women to kill their children or, or, or permitting them is actually good for the woman herself, um, let alone the child. And, and of course, we know that uh, the, 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 that women are disproportionately the victims of abortion and the, and the unborn side as well. So this is there, there are a lot of different angles to how this plays in as a women's issue. So if Carrie is going to uh, engage in, um, you know, medical speculation about, for example, this p magic pill that might do something, I'm, I'm going to do a similar thing, saying, what would the people who are demanding that women carry their children to term feel differently if an abortion simply removed the fetus from the body of the woman, which, if it occurred before viability, would lead to the death of the fetus? If you are not imposing a burden on women to rescue, to do more, then you should be perfectly fine with that. Remove the fetus carefully. It's going to die. Um, but if it, is not, if it is not peculiarly entitled to a kind of sustenance from the pregnant mother that it is not entitled to, um, you know, again, Deliver it to one of Amy Coney Barrett's, um, you know, uh, stations where you can uh, dump your child. Right? She said this is the solution. Well, you know, it, it, 
take the 12 week embryo and, and deliver it to such a station. I don't think that most anti-abortion people would say, fine, that solves the problem. I do want to go to the, uh, I, I'm not qualified to address in detail, but I don't want to leave entirely unaddressed the very important question of federal versus state regulation and how this uh, relates to regulation of uh, other health. Um, in the same way as the maxim that family law is the province of the states, even though both the Constitution and lots of federal regulation do address family law and have for a long period of time, similar kinds of things can be said about the regulation of health. Uh, both the uh, Hyde Amendment and the Affordable Care Act have set various rules about um, reproductive uh, health. Um, and it is unfortunately true that, you know, whichever party and whichever mindset is in power in Washington has this tendency to want to federalize the medical issues it cares about. I think I'm thinking about uh, the attempt uh, to, for example, uh, fortunately unsuccessful attempt to step in and uh, when uh, Oregon had a Death with Dignity Act, um, the federal government um, tried to say that uh, physicians who cooperated the, with this should be um, penalized under federal law. So I mean, the, the dynamic is more complicated uh, and there are a whole series of different data points that one has to take into consideration uh, when one asks the question, is it constitutionally permissible, is it politically desirable um, for the federal government to step in on any of these um, issues of health and um, reproduction. Did you have yeah. All right, Professor Barnett. Hi, um, Randy Barnett from Georgetown Law. Um, I'm gonna make a point that there's a good chance every single member of the panel will disagree with. Um, Something about Lochner. And that, and, and that is, and that is, um, that it seems like the majority opinion in Dobbs was clearly a substantive due process opinion. It was not an originalist opinion. Um, and that means that it is not a threat to substantive due process. It is substantive due process. Now, it is conservative substantive due process. It is a conservative theory of substantive due process that's been in the works for a very long time. Uh, you've seen it in Glucksburg. You saw it in, in the city of Chicago versus McDonald in the plurality opinion, which was purely a substantive due pro a conservative substantive due process um, opinion. Um, and but we but it was only a plurality. And we even saw it in the Hibbs case, which involves. Would you mind, sir? Would, I'm going to ask the question of the panel as to whether they agree with what I'm about to say. Thank you. Um, so um, the question is whether, and in the Hibbs case, we saw it with Justice Ginsburg's opinion. So it's a substantive due process opinion with one qualification, and that is, unlike these previous opinions, it does spend a lot of time on what the current state of the law was in 1868. That is a, that is a kind of an originalist move, but it is only one kind of originalism and one that's largely rejected. So I guess that is my question to the panel. Do you actually, now it may have reached a conservative result, but that doesn't, I mean, I'm sorry, an originalist result, but that doesn't make it an originalist opinion. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have a response to that? I don't agree, really. It, <laughs> so it probably would be surprising to Justice Thomas to hear he signed on to a substantive due process opinion without knowing it. Yeah, and I, I, I don't, I literally do not understand the argument. Right? If, if what you're, because they did not, you know, it is only a substantive due process opinion it would only have been a substantive due process opinion if somebody's substantive due process had been validated. If, for example, they had said fetuses have a right to life, it would be a substantive due process opinion. They didn't. They said this is all up to the legislature. I think it took for granted the framework in Glucksburg. It dropped a footnote saying, if you want to be more originalist about it and run this through privileges or immunities, it's kind of the same historical test. So, and he cites Corfield. So then he says, you know, we're just going to proceed. Um, so I agree. It's granting that for argument's sake. Thank you. All right, in the front <coughs> microphone. Hi. Uh, thanks to the panel. Good, good discussion. I have uh, one comment, one question. A comment to Professor Cole. Um, I've, um, every time I've witnessed a, a rally uh, protesting abortion, a pro life rally, it seems like the majority of people there are women, and not just women, but women of childbearing years. So I'm not sure. The, uh, the point you're making about if men could get pregnant, the law would be different. But uh, that's just anecdotal, but I think it's pretty compelling. Um, the other, uh, my question is about uh, 
uh, equal protection. Um, I guess maybe I'm missing something, but um, when I think of equal protection with respect to sex, I'm thinking about men can own property, women can't, um, men can inherit, women can't. Um, so assuming that equal protection clause applies to sex, um, men can't, that men don't have abortions and, I mean, since men can't have an abortion, um, why, is, why is it equal protection? I just, um, I mean, you might be able to justify abortion on, on other grounds, but why, is it equal, why would equal protection be implicated? So I'm not going to repeat what I said. Let me try and expand on what I said. Uh, again, since Carrie is introducing, um, you know, hypothetical medical procedures, it's my understanding that there is no physiological obstacle to uh, a male body gestating a fetus. The only difficulty is that there is no exit for that fetus. So imagine a situation where uh, the fetus that I, in my last um, hypothetical uh, medical procedure, had very carefully removed pre-viability from the body of a woman, is then implanted into um, the uh, belly of a man. Yes, it would require a cesarean to get that fetus out, but women are forced to endure cesareans, and I do mean forced in some circumstances. So, I mean, if you are really insisting on that kind of one-for-one -one symmetry, uh, I suggest to you it is uh, more imaginable than you might have thought. Men can't get pregnant. I'm just, I'm just, I'm sorry. <laughs> the microphone in the back. Thank, thank you, everyone. My question um, has to do with originalism and uh, women's uh, equal rights. Um, it, it seemed like there was maybe some assumptions that women didn't have equal rights under the 14th Amendment or today consistent with originalism. And um, I was wondering, Bradwell versus Illinois, I think it came out the wrong way in the majority, but Matthew Carpenter, who was one of the architects of the 14th Amendment and leading legal lights on the 14th Amendment, um, made the argument that Bradwell, a woman, was entitled to equal rights, the right to pursue a common occupation as a lawyer. Um, Chief Justice Salmon Chase dissented in that case and said that that was right, that Carpenter, would, suggesting that Carpenter was right, and then the 19th Amendment gave women the preeminent right of citizenship, the right to vote, um, and there's an implication that that would involve all of the other rights of citizenship to the extent there was any ambiguity in the 14th Amendment. So I'm wondering what the basis is for arguing that under originalism, women don't have equal rights um, under the 14th and through the 14th and 19th amendments in their original understanding. Thank, thanks, everyone. Anyone? So again, I commend, sorry to do this, my article, The Ladies Forget About Them, um, a feminist perspective on the limits of originalism in which I discuss this in great detail. I will, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what more uh, I can say than uh, I already have. I will say that, again, in that piece, I go through lots of uh, original meaning, or lots of contemporaneous statements uh, by both the framers, uh, that is to say, the framers of the original Constitution and the Congress in the uh, 19th century. Um, but I, I also go through, I mean, you know, it, it is now um, in the same way as Brown needs to be justified uh, by originalist grounds, uh, and so that's something that most members of the Federal Society uh, accept. People are now trying to justify um, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, revolution and constitutional sex discrimination on originalist grounds, they're doing a very bad job. I mean, S Steve Calabresi has suggested, for example, in a published article that of course, th that what has changed is um, our knowledge of the facts of the matter. Uh, we, we used to think women were not capable and now we think women are capable. Ask John Adams if he thought Abigail was capable. He very much did, and that was precisely why he did not want to give her rights. I, I argue in this piece that the decision uh, to forget about the ladies was as much a dis uh, decision about the allocation of power um, within the, um, the nation as separation of powers, as uh, federalism. What he says is women have enough power in the home and if we gave them equal political rights, if we abolished coverture, then they would have too much power. That's a conscious decision not to recognize women's rights. It's not um, some sort of um, lack of awareness of their possibility. 
And I would, I would just add, you know, if you apply the Dobbs rationale to the question of whether women are protected by the Equal Protection Clause, you would say, well, equal protection doesn't, those terms don't answer that. We have to look at what they were understood to mean at the time that they were adopted. Um, and we look at the practices at the time they were adopted. And uh, if women were not treated equally and there was no suggestion that the adoption of the Equal Protection Clause was meant to override that, then we can't, as a court, recognize that women have equal protection rights because that would be us uh, you know, updating the Constitution or, or, or giving it some meaning other than the one that it was understood, its plain meaning at the time that it was adopted. That's the rationale that the court used in Dobbs. Applied to equal protection, it would reach, reach the same result um, with respect to whether women are protected or not. So originally, it's generally distinguished increasingly between original meaning and originally expected applications. Um, and that's the basis for some originalist scholarship responding to some of these points, explaining that some of these things uh, that were not, as a practical matter, respected are required by the meaning that was enshrined in the clause. It's interesting that the court, in its precedent, uses the long-standing practices or deeply rooted in history test to tell you what unenumerated rights exist under due process or privileges or immunities. They haven't adopted that in the equal protection context. In the, in the due process or privileges and immunities context, the reason they're doing it is, as, as clear on the face of the cases, a, there's a, there's a substantive view about what privileges or immunities means. It means the things that were historically protected. But B, there's this concern not to allow judges who are unelected to update the ter extremely broad terms without any tether, not just in text, but even in history. And I think, you know, speaking to the question of whether originalists would follow their conclusions to their logical premises, I think there's a, a, there's a similar kind of challenge to non-originalist theories of the Equal Protection Clause, right? So if, if the general idea is that, look, the people who ratified the 14th Amendment were bad, they, they had a cramped understanding of who counts as a person deserving of equal protection, and so we should update our understanding of, our application of it. We should let judges update what the amendment means in light of contemporary mores about equality, especially if contemporary mores include more people in the circle of protection. By that logic, if society updates its mores to the point where either society in general or the judges think that the unborn are constitutional persons entitled to equal protection, that's a new view. It's a view that's more expansive of the people who are protected. It's, it's, the proponents of it would say, look, the 14th Amendment people uh, had a cramped understanding of who counted as a person. This approach would require the court to strike down any law permitting abortion or any clause permitting abortion, to require the states to ban abortion as a matter of constitutional law. And I don't think most non-originalists would go there. No, no nor do I think it, 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 it does non-originalism lead you there, nor do I think non-originalism is untethered. As, as you said, it is tethered to the precedents that have, uh, have, have been decided before, to the requirement to give reasons to, the, the, in the same way that every decision by a judge is tethered by precedent, the, the, the interpretation of liberty is, is, is tethered, the interpretation of equal protection is tethered, the interpretation of you know, unstated constraints on the uh, executive power are, and the legislative power uh, are, are, are tethered. Uh, so they're all tethered. Um, um, and, and, and I think you could make that argument. I just don't think it would be a good argument, but you, but but you, you, you can I, I agree that non-originalisms are often tethered in some ways. There's an incrementalism to common law constitutionalism, for example. But I, I was saying, if the idea is we have to update, because the 14th Amendment... No, that's not the idea, though. The, well, the idea well, is not we which, have which, to update. Well, the which, which is, part... The idea is, the idea is we, we have to take the question presented before us. The question presented before us is whether abortion should be constitutionally protected. How do we answer that question? We start with the text. We start with the, um, the principle that liberty um, respects. We look at how the court over the last, you know, whatever, 150 years has interpreted that, what it has extended it to. We try to generalize from that. Uh, and then we uh, draw our conclusion. And you're making an argument that one could make that argument. You could make that argument. And at the end of the day, you can make lots of arguments. All I'm suggesting is you're not untethered. The, the criticism often is if you're not an originalist, you're untethered. 
No, you're not untethered because there's the tethers that always apply. And two, you're not tethered if you're an originalist if you can do originalism when you want to reach one result and not do originalism when you want to do another result. And that's what every originalist has done uh, in, in history. No, no justice, even Justice Thomas, has been willing to go to the mat on originalism. And the, you know, the people who are now fighting to try to figure out how can we justify Brown versus Board and how can we justify women's rights under originalism, they're just not willing to go to the mat. And so they're you know, using the discretion that the doctrine allows to try to come up with different arguments. So all, right. all of these theories give you that discretion and all of them are tethered in some respect. Uh, I'm gonna give this side of the room a chance to comment as well. One, a couple, a couple quick things, one is, I, it, in, I'm sure it's true, given the fact that all of our justices in American history have, have been uh, human beings and therefore prone to error and prone to not being able to stand up to their own uh, uh, standards, that you probably could find every single purported originalist that at times hasn't been able to fully separate his or her uh, policy goals. But at least in attempting, in, 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 in pulling originalism, they are at least attempting to do so. The big problem with many of the other constitutional uh, interpretation methods is they don't even provide a, a means for attempting to do so, and I think that's a real challenge. Uh, just finally, I'll note that, as you, as you said, the question here is, should abortion be covered by the Constitution? And I would submit that's not the question. The question is, is abortion, are, are abortion rights actually covered by the Constitution? And if the judges are asking that question, it's much simpler. And I'm giving Kerry the final word on that. And I will turn to the next question. Thank you. Greg Dolan from the University of Baltimore. I want to bring the conversation a bit back to kind of the original topic, the rule of law part. Um, and I, for that, I have two questions on perhaps you know, issues that were mentioned but not deeply delved into questions. First, I guess, Professor Case, I was a little struck by, and maybe I misunderstood, and so for the, I apologize, so maybe you can expand on your initial answer. First, you said that it's a, it's a problem if the court goes back and revisits a case that was severe, the more kind of severely criticized, kind of when people are unhappy and agitating, and if the court kind of goes back on itself, that's what creates a problem for rule of law. And I don't want to waive the bloody shirt of Brown, but I'm going to ask, for example, in a more Okay, anodyne we are, we are area, like, 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 time, right, so. like, like antitrust. The court gets new data, people agitating, they go back, they change the law. Is it really kind of the agitating and the criticism, is it really a problem? And I'm going to skip my second question since we're out okay, of time. So, right. um, I, I, I'll leave antitrust to the side because as I understood the premise of your question, with respect to antitrust, what changed was a knowledge of the facts, not a restlessness um, about accepting the prior decisions. I'll take Brown. I mean, what, what I see Brown doing and what I see the strategy of the NAACP and the holdings in the cases from Plessy to Brown being, um, it, it's not about unrest on the part of the black population. It's about the workability of separate but equal. It's a court realizing that it tries and tries and tries to apply the doctrine of separate but equal and realizes that even if it asymptotically, and it doesn't even do that, approaches equality uh, to have separateness, it will never approach equality. It, it, is a, it is a legal realization that separate but equal does not work legally. It is not about riots in the streets. It is not about passing legislation um, that is inconsistent with the holding. And, and partly, I mean, there's a, there's a lack of analogy here, right? Because Plessy is a, do is a doctrine of permission, not of prohibition, right? So um, segregation could have been disestablished by um, simply legislators voting for integration. And that differs from the kinds of things that um, are, are subject to this, this heckler's veto, I think. And I'm actually going to turn to one last question. I believe that's right. Roger Severino in yeah, the back. Yes, and indeed. I, you, you might, I am, I am you not going to plant a question, so I'm going to ask Professor Case. Um, you use the hypothetical, what if a child could be taken from the womb without impact on health of the woman, pre-viability. So let's continue that hypothetical, post-viability. And God willing, we'll get to a point where a delivery is always safer than abortion. Presume we get there. Is there any right for that child's life to be ended at the whim or will or reasoning of the mother when her health would not be at issue if that delivery could be completed? Um, 
I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, you're saying that a woman has no right to control over her body or her time? No, I'm saying if it could be removed out of the body without any health implications. Could the mother decide that the child should be killed before that, that delivery? Is, there a, is abortion, in your estimation, I guess Professor Cole too, the right to a dead child, the right to not, no progeny, or simply a right to not be pregnant? I mean, say she I, could transplant it to another woman, yeah, no, surrogate I mean, mother. I, I am, I mean, my own views on this uh, have not been really what comes into question. I'm happy to, in more than the three minutes available to me, discuss them with you. I am trying to deal with the opposition and its claims and to understand those claims and their limits. And that's why I engaged in this hypothetical, because I'm trying to see what exactly it is that the opponents of abortion are claiming and what kinds of imposition they demand of women. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I'd like to, this, this ends our panel and I'd like to thank the panelists and the audience for joining us today. And a reminder that the next convention event, which is the Barbara Olson Memorial Lecture will start at five. Thank you.